Good job. It's a long reading, wasn't it? But it's a great reading. And if you hadn't figured out by now, this day, every year, we we'll always touch on that particular passage in one form or fashion. Uh, would you pray with me, family? Our Holy Father, as we uh, now come before Thee once again to approach Thee and address Thee as the Creator, the Master, and certainly our Savior, our God, Father, we thank Thee for that great privilege. We thank Thee for the great blood of Jesus Christ that makes that possible. And just now, Father, as we continue our worship and study of Thy Word, we pray that the great precepts that will be touched uh, even this day will uh, ring true in our hearts and our minds, and we will go forth as a doing people and not just a hearing people only. Father, we love You so much, and we look forward to this great new year that's ahead of us. We ask all these things in Christ's holy and perfect name. Amen. So one of the reasons that I use that particular passage uh, every year, uh, as it is stated in the outlines that you have, is that they are looking, they are listening to divine instructions about how to chart uncharted waters. Because that's exactly what they were facing. They were facing uncharted waters. They were fixing to step into a water, as Grayson read, that was overflowing its banks because of that particular time of year. I can imagine how scared they must have been. I can imagine even Grandpa talking about the day years ago when they walked through the Red Sea, scared to death. So here's another moment in time when we can look and see that God is interested in your comfort and your security as you go forward into a new land, Joshua 3, into a new year here in Mount Vernon, Texas. And so now that we have this new beginning in front of us, God has already blessed us with two days. So now we've got some 363 days ahead of us. What are you going to do if God continues to allow us to live in the furtherance of our days? What will you do? How will you live in the days to come? And so we, and then we pose the question, as you see before you, new year. Now what? New land. Now what? And God is instructing them very closely about every step that they take. And I believe in the principles we're going to cover this morning, the thoughts that we're going to touch on will guide us in our every step in the new year. Now, you're, you're, you'll, you'll notice that your outlines are blank. I want you to write in those blanks this morning the things that we're talking about. What will you do specific to the new year? What are you going to accomplish? What things do you want to see happen in your own life? Fill those lines out this morning. Fill them out and think about what we're looking at. Now what we're doing is we're, we're bouncing off of Preston's great lesson from last week. Preston, uh, this is a two-part series. We were looking behind and now we're looking ahead. And so Preston touched on these great topics, these bullet points that you would remember from last week. We talked about the congregation and, and your great abilities, the great progress that all of us have made, uh, the, the growth that, that happens even in the last point. We talked about our missions. We talked about our works. So he did a great job in opening our eyes, and I hope that what we do to build today off of that particular lesson helps us in the days to come. So, as you think about those particular ideas, let's begin first with our works and missions. Now, as a clarifying statement, please understand that missions are works. But what I want to do is I want to try to separate it just for a moment so that we can understand what is going on here. And he gave us a great opening uh, thought even last week. So let's think about the, the things that we are involved in. First and foremost, please understand that we are a people that are being watched by God. You remember Revelation 1, verse number 13? The Bible says that one like the Son of Man was walking amidst the candlesticks. Verse number 20 of that same chapter says that the candlesticks are the churches. Here, as the letters begin, even with Ephesus, I know thy works, and I know thy labor. He is full aware of what we are doing, and I would say even of what we are not doing. He's aware of all of that. He knows our works, and He knows our labors. And notice how important works are. Even later in this same phenomenal apocalyptic work, notice that those that die in the Lord 
First of all, they are blessed because of their, uh, their, their diligence, their patience, their steadfastness, chapter 2, verse 10. But also notice that their works do follow them. It's going to be a part of the judgment scene. Those things that we are involved in, <clears throat> or maybe not involved in, those things are going to show up at the judgment bar, friends. That's what the Bible says. And so works are something that God is aware of, and works are something that are going to be involved even in the judgment day. Now, think about those works. One of the great works that we've got going on and that people are being blessed by this very moment. My wife is home with uh, respiratory issues, and she's listening to TGRN right now. She's with you, right? Those individuals that are out there right now that are listening to TGRN... The Philippines, where, wherever it is, these are individuals that are being blessed. Now, years ago, I don't know how far back some of you remember, but we were introduced to the idea of Internet radio by one of our friends named Luis Camacho. We, he, he come in and he presented the work, and our elders said, man, that is impressive. And so, you remember, we tore up. Old Bo was down there. We tore up that old nursery downstairs, and we made a studio, Right? Uh, some things transpired and, and Luis left, but we were still diligent with the idea, what are we going to do? We've already got a studio, we've got this equipment, we need to do something. We hired Ron Smithy. Ron Smithy came in here and, man, like a tornado, he ripped through all of the, the things, the logistics, all the things that had to be done, and he established, helped to establish anyway, the Gospel Radio Network, right? Right? And he's still affiliated with, I think to some degree, he's on kind of a, a retainer, as it were. If we need his uh, help, he said, yeah, I'll be glad to help, no problem. David Sudhoff, to this day, over in Cowan, Tennessee, is the one that is, to this moment in time, taking care of all the administrative efforts for the Gospel Radio Network, and we pay him for that. Uh, the servant is worthy of his hire, right? And so we depend on David. Every time I have a problem, like on Friday morning getting on, David, what's going on? And when he can't figure it out, then he calls Ryan, right? So together we have this great network that is stretching around the globe. She, she for some period of time, Chris could probably tell us in private, for, but for, for some period of time now, she's been self-sustained. The money is coming in from churches of Christ all around the region, and she is running in the black. Everything is great. So we are thankful for the Gospel Radio Network. So you say, what do I do? Well, my friends, first and foremost, do you listen? I'm not going to ask for us to raise our hands because we might be embarrassed this morning. How many of you listen to the Gospel Radio Network this week? Would you be embarrassed just then if you weren't allowed to raise your hand? Are you listening to the Gospel Radio Network? You should be. Because your elders are putting out this content on a daily basis that is good for the edification of the soul. It is sound broadcasting. Nothing is going to get on that, on that network unless it goes through either Ryan or Sudhoff's or our elders that oversee this work. So, do you encourage others to listen? When was the last time you texted someone or emailed somebody and said, man, the, the, the mornings for the master is on? Or uh, when was the last time you texted somebody and asked them, are you listening? Would you like to know more about the Gospel Radio Network? Have you got some of our pens, some of our cards? Do you hand them out on a regular basis? See, you can be participating in the Gospel Radio Network. Maybe you know of a man with a radio voice. They say, I have a radio face. I don't know what that means. <laughs> But if you know someone that has a radio voice or someone that you said, man, that guy should be on the radio, that, should, that guy should be on TV, tell David. Call David today, man. Tell the elders so that they can tell David or, or call Ryan or somebody because we need more broadcasters. We're always needing more broadcasters. You can participate in that. Call one of the guys that you're thinking about. Hey, have you ever thought about being on the radio? You know, that conversation comes up and says, well, I actually am on the radio. Can we have your audio? There you go. Instant program, right? You can give to it. Uh, there are many times when those that have passed away, you'll see in lieu of flowers, leave your donation with the Gospel Radio Network, right? And so there are donations made, even under the oversight of our elders, that go into the Gospel Radio Network with so-and-so's name on it, in memory of... That'd be a great thing to do, but you can always pray. 
Pray for the furtherance of the gospel. Pray, as Paul talked about, further opportunities for opportunities of utterance, doors of utterance. Pray for that as it goes around the globe. And so the Gospel Radio Network is an incredible, an incredible work. And I hope you're receiving the benefits of it because she belongs to us. She is the work of the Mount Vernon Church of Christ. So be a participant in that. He mentioned also last week the Tipton's Children Home. Now we send them $200 a month. And that's, that's you say that's a, a gigantic amount of money. But think about what it takes to run a place like that. $200 a month we send to this fantastic place, this particular place where children are hearing the gospel. And I guess it's fairly appropriate, but these are children that have been discarded. And places like the Tipton's Children Home have taken these children in. They've housed them. They've shown them what love really looks like. Love is not a slap in the face. Love is not a cigarette burn on the neck or on the arm. Love is shown in a place like the Tipton's Children's Home. Right? So when you think about the children's home, when you think about the campus, you think about all the works, all the materials, all the, the house parents, all the things that go into that, it's a huge undertaking, right? It's a huge undertaking. So what can I do to help? In the year to come, because of your giving on the first day of the week, we're going to continue to send them $200 a month. But what can you do? How many of you been to the Tipton's Children's Home? How many want to go to the Tipton's Children's Home? See, we've got an opportunity in front of us this year. Let's do something with the Tipton's Children's Home. Do you think that the children that are there, do you think they'd be upset when about 20 or 30 of us show up and want to see what's going on? Or do you think they'd receive some form of edification? You see, there's things that we can do to help. Maybe they've got a building to erect. Uh, let's go up there and help them with that. There are many things that we can do in the future that are above and beyond what we're already doing. There's a pantry, for, for crying out loud. You guys are phenomenal. It's the Tipton's Children's Home that comes every month and says, man, you guys give more than anybody. Hats off to you. You're doing a great work, but what more can we do in the year to come? I mean, if we're reaching higher and we're reaching farther, read your bulletin article. If we're reaching higher and farther in the new year, I would submit to you that just sending a check for $200 is way not enough. Amen. Let's get involved, right? We're going to talk about that again in, in a few minutes. Also, there's the uh, Cherokee Children's Home. So now we go from Oklahoma down to Cherokee, uh, which is down around uh, that neck of the woods where uh, Aaron always goes, Arrowhead digging. Cherokee's down around the Austin area down that way. It's about 300 miles down there, just like it is up to Tipton. So five hours in either direction, whichever way you want to go. We can be at one of these children's homes uh, in about five hours driving time. Now, the Cherokee Children's Home is another great work that we promote. We send them $200 a month, and we, we uh, and insist that the money is spent in a proper way, and our brother uh, is going to be here soon, I hope. Uh, he's got my message. Hopefully we'll get in touch. But I want to have both of these individuals that, that uh, are our contacts from the Tipton's home and from the Cherokee home, I want to have them stand before you and edify you knowing about what's being done with your monies. Notice all the baptisms. Notice all of the edification. Notice all the benefits that are going on there. See, it's a two-way edification process. And so what more can we do? How many have been to the Cherokee Children's Home? How many want to go to the Cherokee Children's Home? See, we have abilities in the days to come that we've not yet considered. Again, if you go down there and you show up like they showed up from Ladonia at the Home of Recovery, do all in, are you all encouraged by that at all? The same thing can happen at Cherokee the same thing can happen at Tipton. So let's think about what more we can do in the year to come. Also, there's Camp Ida. You say, well, now, Camp Ida's a little bit more speed, you know. It's just an hour down the road. 
And, uh, and that's great. We give them $350 a year. Some of that helps to pay uh, Preston's uh, 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 income out there. Uh, $350 a month to a great work that is... How many thousands of souls have we affected? I have no earthly idea. Hundreds upon hundreds. We might say myriads of people that have been affected, those that <clears throat> met at, those that have started relationships, even at that great place. There is a lot of success stories that we can share even from Camp Ida. And so when you think about the camp itself, don't just go and look at the website and say, wow, that's pretty cool. Get involved. You say, how do I get involved? Well, I'll tell you, you need to go and talk to that guy right there. <laughs> <At that track. laughs> See how that works? He's the administrator, right? He is the one that goes out there every Tuesday. And, and is sweeping and mopping and heavens to Betsy. I don't know what all he does out there. From 8 o'clock to about 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he's working every Tuesday. Go with him. Go with him and get involved in that. There's work days that pop up from time to time, you know, and if you have the ability to be a part of those, tell your grandkids about it. Get your cousins involved. Tell people about Camp Ida and let's do something. Be on the $350 a year that we give. Be on the scholarships that our elders provide for you that are going. Be on that. What can you do? We can get involved individually, can't we? So in the new year, we can be involved in the children's homes. We can be involved in the, the Gospel Radio Network. We can be involved even in Camp Ida more than we are now. But then we got the home recovery. The home of recovery. What a phenomenal work. We send them $1,000 a month. $1,000 a month helps to pay good men like Aaron. Helps to take care of food. Helps to buy supplies. Helps to put gas in the van. Whatever. And you're not the only ones. There are many churches of Christ that send the home recovery monies. Because that's the society we, that's the society we live in. Have to have money to purchase these things, Right? You've got amazing men that have come here to this location, a 14-room uh, benefit that was in the mind of Jim Hampton years ago as he stood in the various jails that he was associated with and looked at these young men that society has kicked to the curb, and he said, there's got to be a better way. So... He bought an old run-down piece of ground that used to have a bunch of drunks in it called the VFW, and he flipped it, and he turned the dance hall into an assembly hall. And now we've got men here with us today Amen. that are evidence of the great work that is still going on there. How many of you have been to the home recovery? Oh, we've got more hands now, right? How many of you want to go to the home recovery? Here's an example just twice that I know of, and Aaron might be able to tell us more, just twice there's been a congregation called Ladonia, Ladonia? Oak, Ridge. Oak Ridge that have come down in droves, brought 20, 30 people at a time, brought ribeyes, brought grills, brought... Do you think they were encouraged by that? When was the last time we did that? You see, there's a lot more that we can do in the new year as it relates to this great work. These men are certainly deserving of it. Jim, Hampton, Jim Hampton's great idea is deserving of that. We need to be more involved with the great home recovery. Can you teach a Bible class? They need teachers, right? From the beginning, remember some of our ladies, they signed up and they adopted a room and they supplied everything that was in a particular room. Bedspreads, decorations. We've been there from the beginning, but let's not stop. Just because we send them $1,000 a month don't mean that we need to stop. Oh, well, the elders are already doing something. What are you doing? We need to be involved. And so these works are terribly important. So when you see the frame that comes up from time to time talking about the pantry item, get involved with that. Put those things in the closet out there. Right? You've got things that pop up. Tell Mike Rose, I got a freezer. I got an extra mattress, whatever. Let them see your diligence. Let them see Christ's light shining in you. Also, there's the jail ministry. Now, we don't technically 
have anything on paper that we give to the jail ministry every month, but the elders be the first one to tell you, you need a Bible, go buy a Bible. Right? You need a, a set of glasses, go buy a set of glasses. They would provide anything at any time and have. There is one young man that he and his wife, they live down around Mineola. They send us $50 a month. And because of that young fellow, we've got some five or $600 in the bank now that stays there on a regular basis so that Candy and Kay and others, when they go, they've got plenty of supplies that they can take in. We've got glasses that we can buy, and, and they do ask for glasses a lot. Uh, we've got all the, the tracks, English and Spanish, and those things are able to be bought. But what are you doing? The ladies and the men. We're weary. We need teachers. We need help. Eight or nine ladies, I guess it was, in this last class. We need help teaching these ladies. There are counseling sessions that I go to on Tuesdays. These guys, they want to know about the home recovery. What is this home recovery that you guys are talking about? How can I get there? The ladies, how do I get there? We don't have one for the ladies. What are we going to do about that? There's so many needs for these young people. These individuals that make, basically just make stupid mistakes, uh, to tell you the truth. Uh, some of these individuals have been released and put on probation or parole and, and some of the, the mistakes that we make afterwards. They violate that situation and we have to go back. Friends, when you drive by this building, when you drive in that driveway and you get your tags every year, please think about those people that are inside that place. Those people that have been kicked to the curb. Those people that have tatted themselves all up and people just shun them when you, when you see them, they don't look at you. Those individuals, they need love just like you and me. And the church is all about love. Can you teach a Bible class? Please go with us. Currently, Michael's going with us. Coach Stoker's going with us. Eric is going with us. But we need teachers. We need people to stand up and teach the gospel. Are you a lady? And you can teach? Come talk to Kay right after this is over. Talk to Candy. Let's get you involved. Let's get you on a rotation. Same with the men. We're there every Sunday at 4 o'clock. Can you go and teach? Let me know. We need men to teach the gospel in the jail. Every week when we take three or four people in there, they are completely amazed that that many people actually care about them. We can be involved even beyond your wildest expectations. I want you to understand that as we talked about TGRN, Tipton's, talked about Cherokee, talked about Camp Ida, HRR, we're thinking about the jail. Please remember that the way that we interact with people, the way that we respond to people's needs, it has everything to do with the judgment. That's the point that was trying to be made in Revelation 14 and verse 13. Your works do follow you. In Matthew 25, beginning, Jesus said, I was hungered and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. When? Jesus said in verse number 40, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Will you go with us to the Tipton home? Will you go with us to the Cherokee home? How about to the home recovery? Will you go with us to the jail? Will you tell others about the things that are going on here so that they can be involved? Tell them about the Gospel Radio Network. You see, we can be involved. Jesus in the great Sermon on the Mount, He says very, very plainly that our faith, our religion, this is the precept, it's a second mile religion. Mile number one, $1,000 a month. Mile number two, can you fill in the blanks now? Preparing meals, teaching classes, giving clothing, helping them to find a freezer. The second mile religion, friends, that's what we're involved in. Just because we're given $200 or $350 or $1,000, please don't let that be the end of this work. We've got to be involved in it. 
We've got to be involved in this work. Verse 47 in the same passage, even in the context of loving our enemies, the precept here is what do you more than others? Yeah, that's right. Somebody said, oh, that's right. That's, that's the, the thought that I need to be having right now. Friends, there is a lot that we can do in the new year as it relates to our missions, as it relates to our works. Now, for about two years, we have not got to see this shining face uh, because of COVID and various other things. We haven't been able to go to Costa Rica. Still got money in the bank. Got about 16, 17 grand in the bank waiting on us whenever we get ready to go to Costa Rica, whenever we get ready to make a trip. But we haven't been able to go. So we're just sitting on the yellow, sitting at the light in neutral, waiting on the opportunity. Well, I talked to Raphael, and he has the same concerns. And so he said that right now Costa Rica is still a hotbed. They don't have the vaccinations and the things like you have. They have to pay for all of their tests. Their tires are sometimes marked in the driveway because they're not allowed to drive their cars more than once or twice a week because that would mean that you're interacting with other people and spreading the disease. So there's a lot going on in Costa Rica that we hadn't even thought about, that we haven't even begun to experience. But he said that Peru's open. What do you think about preaching the gospel in Peru? Would you go to Peru? I would go to Peru. And so, as I talked to Raphael the other day, he committed to take a summer trip with us and guide us to Peru. Now, maybe that doesn't come to pass for some other reason. I don't know. It doesn't stop there. He said, I tell you what, if we can't go to Peru, he said, I'll come to your town and we'll have a Spanish mission right there in your town. What does that sound like? Does that sound like progress? Preston and Autumn, they speak Spanish. They can teach them. I just put you on the spot, by the way. <laughs> I mean, we have the ability to do that here, but for some strange reason, we haven't touched it. What are we going to do about that in the new year? Maybe we go to Peru. Maybe we have a Spanish evangelistic seminar right here in this building. What a phenomenal thought that is. You see, there's more things in front of us in the year to come than we've even begun to think about. The Bible tells us in Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, that we have the responsibility as God's people to go into all the world. Peru, Costa Rica, Jamaica, all these various places that our brothers are going on a regular basis. That's part of the mission. And we have a responsibility to be a part of that. Not just send them $100, but be a part of it in some form or fashion, preaching the gospel. In Matthew chapter 9, beginning at verse number 37, the, the concept is still true today, just as it was in Isaiah's day when people had hardened hearts and hardened ears and hardened eyes and they wouldn't listen. The same is true today, but the same thing is true that the harvest is wide open. There are millions of people that have not heard the gospel. There are millions of people that are living supposing they have been saved because somebody taught them a false gospel. There are millions of people that need the gospel. And if we can go to Peru, and if we can go to Costa Rica, or if we can go somewhere else, fantastic. But what about the people in our own area that need the gospel? We need to be involved in that. So we need to have that Isaiah 6, 8 mentality. Here am I, send me. When the opportunity arises, when the elders announce some sort of an event, you say, I'll go. I'll go. You need to be like the pose. I'll go. First time that thing came open, it's like, oh, can I go? You got a paint. Oh, that's cool. I'll go. Here am I, send me. So there's a lot to do with works and missions. And we've exhausted a lot of time, talk, a lot of time talking about that. But I want to close with this, this final idea that none of these works, none of these missions, nothing is going to be available until we examine self. So it's got everything to do with the household of God right here in Mount Vernon. Because without you supporting any of these works and helping with all these works and with these missions, there's nothing left to talk about. 
we're starting to think about missions and starting to think about those things again. So let's talk about the household of God just for a minute. In 1 Peter 1, verse 22, the Bible tells us that those that are purified, those that are raised to walk in the newness of life, Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, those individuals that have washed their souls in obeying the truth of the gospel, those are the individuals that are tasked with loving one another. John 13, beginning in verse 34, says that those people, those people have that badge. Well, that's not a badge, but they have that badge of discipleship. They are known by their love, Jesus said there in that text. So we have a responsibility to show our love, express our love, be loving, words, thoughts, actions, etc. But also when you look at passages like 1 Corinthians 1.10, as a loving group of people, we must be a unified group of people. Remember in the first uh, century church here, they were preacher followers. They had, oh, I baptize a Paul or Paulus or Cephas. They had divisions among them, and that was condemned. And even as our class this morning talked about, there are various levels of division that pop up throughout the kingdom. And sad that is. But we have to understand that we have to be a loving people certainly one to another. Galatians 6 and verse 10 says, Do good unto all, especially those of the household of faith. So we've got to be a loving people. We've got to be a unified people. So here's a thought as we go forward in the new year. 1 Thessalonians, Paul says, As touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you. I would say that about you. I think each of you know what it is to be showing brotherly kindness, brotherly love. And so, I would agree with Paul, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another, and there's a plethora of passages that deal with that. We've mentioned a few of them already. But notice what he says, brethren, increase more and more. Did you hear what he said? He said, you guys are loving, and it is seen everywhere. Your love is known in all of Macedonia, but you can do better. Now, what about us? Can we do better? You better believe we can do better. I know I can do better. Can you do better? We can all increase. And so as you think about the works of the church, those three kind of bullet points that we highlight as often as possible, we're involved in edification, benevolence, and evangelism. Can we increase in our benevolence? Brian will tell you yes. Can we increase in our edification? I say yes. Just the cards that we're fixing to write here in the next hour. That's all about edification, isn't it? That's just one little piece of the puzzle. We can all increase in edification and evangelism. We've just talked a little bit about that, even through TGRN, through the evangelistic effort that we might be able to have here in the Spanish community. We need to be about teaching the gospel on a regular basis. That's the three points that the church is mainly involved in, and everything else kind of branches out under those three headings. Can we do better? Absolutely, we can do better in all of those areas. Here's three thoughts. You express your love. I express my love in attendance. You have expressed your love for me by being here this morning. I have expressed my love for you by being here this morning. And so think about attendance. Think about the various aspects of attendance and showing love and knowing that we can do better. Today's Friends and Family Day. How many of you invited friends? How many of you brought friends? How many of you have been inviting friends? You see, already Chip can do better. I can do better as it relates to friends and family. Well, I didn't realize. Man, it's been going on for five years. Same thing every first Sunday of the month. So, can I do better in my attendance even inviting others to attend? Absolutely so. Even today we're going to share a meal. There's those in this room that aren't going to be there. Why? Oh, I prefer the food at the Mexican restaurant. Do you prefer the company? You can be here today for the meal. There's plenty of food. Sing out devotional that follows. Kaysen. We've tasked Kaysen with preaching a Devo today. I'm looking forward to that. And I hope you are too. The sword sharpening that Michael does every week and the Dairy Queen card he dangles in front of you guys. That's a great opportunity. 
Why would you not attend that? That's on you. Fill in those blanks. Sunday nights. Sunday nights. We have opportunities at South Tilla. We've got opportunities to go to North Jefferson. We've got opportunities to go all over the place. If you want to. See, the case is a lot of times we don't want to. But what do we do on Sunday nights? What about the deep dive events that are Sunday nights, Sunday afternoons? I'm getting a lot of blank looks. Come to the deep dives. We're studying under, under Preston with 1 Thessalonians. We're going to continue in that particular study every second and fourth Sunday. Go ahead and mark it on your calendar. The deeper dives. Those are on the fifth Sundays. We've got one coming up in January, fifth Sundays. Let's go ahead and plan to be a part of that. See, our attendance is something that we can fix. It's something that we can do better in. It's something that I just got to make up my mind that I'm going to do it. That I'm going to show you love the way I hope that you would show me love. Think about all the other stuff. Just what, 13 days. 13 days this room's going to be filled with ladies preaching the gospel. Our Young Ladies Day is coming up. That's an amazing thing. If you're a lady, you need to be here. End of story. That's it. Have you already planned to do that? That would be yes. <laughs> you need to be there. It's something that our elders have said is a worthy feeding opportunity. Some of our ladies that are sitting with us here right now are planning those lessons. And then you just don't show up? It's kind of a slap in the face, isn't it? <sighs> yeah, he said that. Uh, think about the gospel meeting coming up with Don Blackwell in May. Have you already planned on doing that? What about the other things like the ladies' Bible class? And I, I hope I don't embarrass her. Poor R Miss Rita has showed up here on two different occasions that I know of and sat back there in a the dark room waiting on the ladies to show up and nobody showed up. And so she just went home. Come on, ladies. Every third and fourth, right? Third and fourth. Every third and fourth Thursday, there's a ladies' class. No, no, you got to work sometimes. Can you do better? All of us can do better. Make me a servant workshop in February. The Bible Bowl. Every, every year between October and April, it's always the same. Second Mondays. It's always the same. You can plan on it unless the Lord comes. You can plan on being a part of that. The men's breakfast, the leaders' luncheon, all these things are attendance opportunities. And so think about our text. Increase more and more. Can you do something about your attendance? I can. What about you? But will you? What about your giving? Oh, he just had to go there, didn't he? Well, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 16, verse number 2, that we need to be a giving people. As he has prospered us, we give according to the way we've been prospered on the first day of the week. You know, we got like 160 or 70 grand in the bank right now because of gifts and because of your giving. We've got an amazing group of people here that love to give. And you should be praised for that. God gets the glory. But we have an ability to do things that other congregations do not have the ability to do because of your love, because of your generosity. And so, when you think about giving, think about some of the things that come into play. We've got a food pantry back here, right? We've got a food pantry that we have the opportunity to give to on a regular basis, even for the home recovery, even back here for the Tipton's home. We've already talked about that, and y'all have done an amazing... There's stuff in a brown bag right back there now. Somebody's already brought. So y'all are doing a great job. So keep up the good work. The disaster efforts that we see throughout the year, even this last one that we just saw, remember? Because of your donation and the elders' foresight and their, their great generosity, we sent them a check for almost eight grand. Because you are a giving and generous people. So to God be the glory. Keep that up. Keep that up. But as it relates to weekly stuff, can I challenge your thinking a little bit? Those of us that gamble in the stock market, 
Do you give according to the prosperous trading benefits that you get at the end of the week? Oh no, it's Corban. Boy, I got some looks on that one, didn't I? See, we don't think about that. Do we think about those monies that are registering on our phones every day? And do we give according to that? Do we give according to the real estate flips that we do? The, the cars that we sell? Do we think about those profits that are coming in? Do we give according to the way we prospered or the way we think we prospered? There's, of course, there's the weekly paychecks. There's the side jobs that we do for a little extra money here and there. The little babysitting job that we did, you know, for $25. There's the gifts. Grandma sent me $200 for Christmas. Did you give according to that? Oh, that's not really prospering. Well, then explain to me what prospering is exactly. Isn't that receiving some sort of a blessing from another? An employer or otherwise? You see, I want us to be challenged in our thinking in the days to come about every aspect of our private lives. We need to be giving according to the way that He has prospered us. And we can all do better. This board says so because it's up and down all the time. I know we can do better. And the elders are counting on you so that these works can go forward. Now, if you've got an argument against anything that I've said, please consider the tenet that's found in Malachi 3 and verse 8. Because notice that Israel had failed in giving as they had been prospered. Now, I know that's a New Testament policy. Understand that. But looking back, notice that what God said is that through your tithes and your offerings that you have not been giving, you have robbed me. And friends, I don't want to know your business, but I tell you that none of us need to stand before the judgment bar having robbed God of anything. So when you think about the very things that we have the opportunity to do, finally I leave you this idea. Are you sacrificing in your daily lives the way that Jesus sacrificed in His daily life? I mean, if we are Christians, then we must be sacrificial individuals. I think that's what Paul had on his mind when he wrote even in Romans chapter 12. As we offer our bodies a living sacrifice, what does that mean? Brian gave us that great picture of actually climbing up on the altar voluntarily like Isaac. That's the picture. That's the way your Lord climbed up onto the cross that day and spread His arms that they might be pierced and His feet that they might be pierced. That's a living sacrifice and we are to live in the same fashion. We live daily the way that the Bible tells us in Luke 9 and verse 23. If we're going to be followers of Him, that involves denying ourselves. Denying ourselves with all those various lusts that are mentioned. The lusts that were there in the garden, the lusts that were there between Diabolos and Jesus that day in Matthew chapter 4, those that are mentioned in 1 John 2 beginning at verse 15, it's all the same. Denying these lusts, denying ourselves. Titus 2 says that we are to deny these things. We are to live soberly and righteously. And so denying of oneself, the sacrificial living that God expects of us is something that we must be involved with as we go forward in the days to come. And so as you think about the, uh, the, the, uh, the opportunities that are ahead of you, See to it. Only Chip can take care of Chip. But Chip wants to see to it that Chip gives himself unto the Lord. That is what sacrificial looks like. It looks like 1 Corinthians 16, 15, where the house of Stephanus was addicted to the ministry. Sacrificial living is something that we have to be involved with on a daily basis. Things we see and do and go, places that we go, sometimes we just don't need to do and see and go. And so as you think about sacrificial living, understand our attendance, our giving, sacrificial living, and all the other things that we could talk about if we had another three hours. 
300 and now 63 days of opportunity are here right in front of you. They're the same for everybody. Did you hear that? I've got 24 hours just like you've got 24 hours. We've all got the same opportunities, but what are you going to do with it? I would offer to you today, we've got three marks on our calendar already. You remember what they are? January 15th is the ladies' day, right here. February the 5th, uh, the 5th and 6th, basically, make me a servant workshop, right? Go ahead and check those off. You need to be here. Elders have set the food out. And then obviously in May, we have that opportunity for Don Blackwell coming and spending a couple days with us and preaching the gospel, even from a wheelchair. But will you be here? But will you come and dine with us? Mark your calendars now. You're, you're in luck because we actually have a new calendar. I'm going to give these out at the, in the foyer here in a few minutes. Take these home this afternoon and mark the events so that when that page rolls over on your refrigerator in your office, you'll already have it marked. And so what do we do about the rest of all these months? Well, I'll tell you what. In March, let's have a door knocking. Are you all okay with that? This would be yes. In March, let's have a door knocking. Let's invite the other congregations to come and knock doors with us get the home involved. Let's get all these doors in Mount Vernon knocked and tell them that the gospel is here. Well, you come on down the line and there's April. Let's go to, the, let's go to Tipton's. Y'all want to go to Tipton's? Cherokee? Let's, let's do these things that we've talked about. Let's go ahead and mark our calendars. We got May cover. What about June? Well, camp. Got camp in June. But we could do some other stuff, couldn't we? You see, we could go through each month and we could talk about the, av the availability of time and not plan a single thing. But let's fill the days up. Let's redeem the time, right? Ephesians 5.16. Let's work out our own salvation. Philippians 2 and verse 12. Let's do those things under the oversight of these three fine men that are very interested in your personal growth and the works that are currently going on here. Encourage them. Encourage one another. You see, in front of us are many decisions that we have got to make, individually and collectively. But as you sit this afternoon or this week, as you think about it before you go to bed tonight and you ponder, what is it that we could do? I hope that you'll have that Isaiah 6, 8 mentality. <coughs> Whatever it is, I hope that you'll come to our overseers and you'll say, here am I, send me. Thinking about camp. Go see that young fellow right there. Here am I, send me. You see, it starts with me. And before we can get to the Tipton's home, before we can have a door knocking, before we can go to Peru, I have to be right. And I have to be willing. And I have to be ready before I can encourage anybody else. And so that's the invitational thought even today as you think about what's before us. The new year's here. But now what? Well, first of all, you need to make sure that your sins are washed away. You need to make sure that you are saved and God has added you to the Son's kingdom. You do that by being immersed for the mission of your sins. Right? Very first gospel sermon that was ever taught in Acts chapter 2. Go read it. Baptism is for the purpose of salvation. And then living faithfully after that. Abounding in the work of the Lord. That's how you stay that way. Steadfastness, patience, remaining in the house, the way that Rahab, what Rahab was told that day. These are things that we need to be thinking about daily as we look at the 363 days that are ahead of us, if the Lord allows. Maybe it is the case that you've already washed those, had those sins washed away. Maybe you just realized, I got a lot of work to do. 
That's where Chip's at. Maybe you would confess the same. You see, there's various aspects of the invitation being necessary in all of our lives this morning. Maybe yours involves a public confession, a public admission that you need the help of this family. We want to help you with that. Maybe you understand that being immersed for the remission of your sins is something that you had not done. You're ready to do it. Let's do it today. Whatever we can do to help you as you walk into the new year, these uncharted waters, let it be known while together we stand and while we sing. Oh,